Hey everybody, and welcome to the third installment of the Red Books Thought Leadership Series. I am Samir Jagatia, President of Red Books, and I'm excited to introduce you all to today's guest, Scott Bender. Scott is a veteran of the digital sales community. He has over 20 years of experience working at, working at Turner, Fox, IGN, and Bizarre Voice. He is currently at Prohaska Consulting, focusing on programmatic strategy. Scott lives in New York City with his wife and daughter. When Scott is not working, he is training for the New York City Marathon. This will be his fifth one and first in nine years. Though I'd be interested in learning more about the marathon experience, we'll stick to the agenda for today. For the next 30 or 40 minutes, Scott will share key strategies on the changing digital sales environment. I'll be moderating questions for him to answer throughout his discussion and during some dedicated Q&A time at the conclusion. Some of you have already sent questions in, and I have those with me. For the rest of you, please use the chat box in the window as, as questions come up. Without further ado, the floor is yours, Scott. Great. Thanks, Samir. I um, want to talk about today a little bit about really the transactional way of our business. That's, I don't want to say it's going away, but it's certainly changing. We're going to talk about that, part one of our talk in the emerging marketplace as a result of this. And then part two, we're going to talk a little bit about programmatic. It's hard in the span of an hour or a half hour to get into big details, but I did want to provide a little bit of a prime, primer on pr programmatic and just some of the different parts that are there and what's relevant to this new world that we're in as publishers. And, you know, based on my background, I would put myself in that group as well. But before we get started, I want to ask you, what are some of your pain points? And certainly you can go to the chat window through Samir and submit some questions of your own or some points of your own. But what are you feeling right now? What are some of the challenges that you're seeing in the marketplace? Maybe this next slide can help you um, and probably some of the same answers that you would put down. Certainly we're all in a very, very crowded marketplace. We're not competing with just a few people. We're you know, competing with several hundred, certainly in the digital ad space. Um, all trying to win the hearts and minds of overworked and you know, understaffed buyers and even on the client side and uh, saying me too, me too as well. I'm not going to go through all these terms, but even things like mobile where, you know, for most publishers, you know, more than 50% of their inventory is now, you know, through mobile. And unfortunately, that the dollars and the CPMs haven't necessarily followed suit with that, at least not at this point. And then, of course, right in the middle is programmatic, um, which we're going to talk about. And it's something that, you know, where a couple of years ago, if you were on the sales side, or a sales manager or publisher, it was something nice to know, um, good to be aware of and know the terms. Now it's not nice to know, it's must have strategy, must have strategy right away. So where do you go from there? Um, where do we go as salespeople in this emerging marketplace? And it isn't just about programmatic, which we're going to talk about. So certainly, you know what, things are great, right? Dollars are up in digital, more money keeps moving to digital. We, we see all the press releases, we see all the studies from everybody and anyone. Um, these are the types of articles that you probably get forwarded to you if you're on the sales management side from people that aren't quite as deep in your world on an ad sales standpoint. But we also know that even with the pie getting bigger, um, it's really in many ways concentrated in just a few players, really just, you know, in this situation or this example for me, marketer, just half of those dollars are, you know, concentrated among five different players. And it's probably a very consistent story within other parts of the business such as video and mobile. So you see where things are going, too. Even beyond the pie, of course, um, getting bigger, more of those dollars are shifting to programmatic. It isn't any more you know, a question of if. It's really just a question of when. You can talk to different players out there. You could read the studies and the articles and the polls, and, and everybody will have a different answer of how much money they're going to shift to programmatic over the next year. Um, it varies, but I think you know, it's safe to assume we, you know, we have to get our heads out of the sand. It's real. It's happening. So how do we adjust to this new world? So it's, you know, we have our challenges in this marketplace. So really what I want to talk about today is the fact that our marketplace is changing. It isn't just about programmatic. The fact is that there's been changes coming into place for a long time, but I really feel they've kind of reached a crescendo even in the last year. I don't know about you, but at least from my side of things, both on the sales side and then talking to other publishers, I've probably seen more change in the last year than I have in the last five. Again, not just pro in programmatic, but just with the new players coming in from a technology standpoint, other players going away, others consolidating. Bottom line is we've got to reevaluate the way we're going to market, um, even beyond programmatic, just in how we talk to our customers, how we talk to the brands, how we talk to the agencies. 
So a little bit about what's going away. RFP marketplace. Um, I don't want to say it's going away. It's not dead necessarily, but you know you could argue that maybe it is terminal. Um, you know the, the bottom line is you have a number of the holding companies, if not all of them, the Omnicoms, the WPPs, the IPGs, you know Publicis. They're not looking to do business with more players. They're looking to do business with few. It's you know it's tough enough to keep up with the players that they have now. Even strategic players that you would assume would be automatics are no longer automatics. That marketplace that we call the RFP marketplace is is getting smaller, and it's been this gravy. I don't want to say gravy train, but it certainly it's been this channel where if you're a startup or a mid-sized publisher, um, certainly the large guys as well. well. This is where you've gone in and went to get your business. Um, whether you were successful or not is another story, but it's, you know what, there's going to be less of an opportunity here. Related to that is the direct agency digital groups. Um, and the fact is that, you know, they're not going away, but they are going to be transacting with different, you know, smaller number of players, and those groups are going to get smaller as well. When you look at just the economics of the situation where, you know, it takes maybe more four or five times as many people to transact on the digital side for half the dollars than maybe you could do in broadcast and cable, that's a problem. I mean, we talk about the margins that we're experiencing on the sales side, the cost of doing business, the cost per salesperson, you know, the economics of our business, and if we think we have a challenging time, let's look at the agency side of the business. So that's something that's certainly, you know, it's going away, and it's certainly being minimized unless you have the right opportunity, the right solution. And then the last thing that I think um, needs to stop it needs to come back into, and that is bringing the client back into the room. I think in digital media, um, we've had a tendency to be, and other media platforms could be guilty of this as well, but to really kind of focus on media metrics, on media goals, on our campaigns, how they're going to deliver, um, what our product's all about, and less about what the goals of the client are. And we've got to bring the client back in the room. What are, what are their solutions? What are their challenges? What are their problems? So the marketplace is closing. This is what I mean by the register is closing. It's, it's getting smaller. That's not to say the transactional side of our business is going to go away, um, but it, much of it is going to be automated. Anything that can be standardized, we're already seeing it with display, mobile and video are soon to follow, is going to be more on an automated basis. That doesn't take away what we do as, you know, as a business. It doesn't take away the direct sponsorship opportunities, the bells and whistles that we sell, but it's going to make our world a little bit more challenging. So for many of you, maybe this is, you know, this is old news. You realize this. This is not something that's new. The question is, where do we go from there? How do we, you know, reimagine what we are as sellers? How do we change our business? How do we change our go-to-market? So first off, we as publishers need to get enterprising. And what I mean by that is, it, you know, boils down to, you know, not assuming that they're there ready to buy, not assuming that there's a ready market for what we're doing. Um, it's first identifying a problem. You know, the basic you know, definition of what an enterprise sell is, is just, you know, it's identifying a problem or a challenge that that client or agency is going through, um, f highlighting a solution, and then only then do you bring yourself into the room of what that solution might be. So challenge and problem, identifying it, outlining the solution, and then bringing in your particular fit about this. So, you know, we have a tendency, and it's again, not just within digital media, but this is where we need to, I think, step up is we need to, and it needs to be less about us, it needs to be more about them. What is their challenge and solution? What are they going through? You can pick up the trades and read them any day and figure out that, you know, it is not an easy time right now to be a marketer. Um, what is the solution? How do you fit into that solution? So we're going to talk a little bit about this. First off, what do you really know about the brand and its various stakeholders? What do you know about the client? Um, certainly, you know, it's great to know about the category, competitive market landscape, Certainly you should know about media spending and history. Yep, you can go ahead and find out things like what are they buying right now. Um, there's a variety of sources that you can go ahead and do this with. You know, LinkedIn, your own intelligence. Certainly our friends at Redbooks are a terrific source to go ahead and do this. But beyond that, beyond the fact that Schick is um, putting out a new razor in fourth quarter, what is, um, what is their KPI? How are they evaluating success? What is keeping them up at night? What are they trying to solve? What we're going to talk about is the fact that, you know, in many cases, the goal of the brand, what their challenges, what their metrics are, are going to be distinct from the agency. And you kind of have to bring the both, both of those things together if you're going to be successful. And then related to that is the agency. You know, it's funny. I, I think this has changed to a certain extent, but still, if you, I think if you pull some digital sellers, I know we have some on the line here beyond just managers, and you ask them who the client is, 
they'll point to the name on the person issuing the RFP. Maybe if you're lucky, they'll CC the person, that, you know, they'll point, point to the person that's CC'd on the RFP as well. Of course, we know that isn't the client. That is your agency contact on a good day. That is your partner, your agency partner. Um, we need to be not only reaching out to the clients, which you just talked about a second ago, but the senior level people within the agency, if you're going to fashion a solution, if you're going to really get beyond just this RFP stage. Um, if you have a mobile solution, who is the mobile specialist? If you've got something that ties into social, who is the evangelist? Are these folks necessarily the ones that are going to transact on the RFP? No, probably not. Rarely ever. However, they're going to do a couple things for you. They are going to be able to provide some insight that you're not going to be able to find otherwise, certainly not from maybe sometimes your immediate contacts who may know less about the business than you do. Um, they can be champions. You can avert them from being uh, obstacles to what you're trying to do. And in many cases, not most cases, these are the people that are closer to the client than your initial contacts. So it's great to know what they're buying. Um, it's great to know the basic information. But this is information you should be finding out well in advance of any meeting, any conversation, any reach out. You know, the typical call that you go out there with, at least I've seen in my past, is you spend half the meeting trying to find out this basic information where much of this insight can be found with enough detective work and enough resources as well. So it's not just showing up anymore. I don't know if Woody Allen actually made this line up, or, uh, but I think it's at least attributed to him. You can't just come out there with you know, a nice shiny PowerPoint, the inevitable ComScore ranking that puts you at top, um, some shiny logos. It's, you've got to do more than that. You've got to have something unique. Um, if you don't have something unique, you know, it's why bother? What's the point at that point? So how do you? So what is unique about you? Is it your data? Is it the data solution great? Um, is it something that's actually you can put into action? Is it something that's really going to be valuable to that customer? Is your audience something that can't be replicated elsewhere? Is it a native sponsorship? Um, you know, or something from a you know well lit thing that you can't do anywhere else? The questions you need to ask yourselves are: Is that sponsorship? Is it? going to be heavy lifting from the agency or the client front. Certainly they don't have the bandwidth um, that you would think they would have in terms of being able to execute on these things. And I guess the question for you is, is this something that you want to be able to do? Is it repeatable? Is it a business or is it a one-off that gets you a, a deal right now but really doesn't sustain a business? Um, and research and insights. Um, I think you're seeing more publishers and more entities out there coming up with insights. Extremely valuable. In many cases, both brands and agencies don't have necessarily the bandwidth or the budgets to always buy these types of things. So when you bring in that type of learning, it goes a long, long way. But you have to ask yourself, is it valuable? Um, you can't just throw up research studies for the sake of throwing them out there and waste everybody's time. But it's other things like this that set you apart beyond just selling your standard inventory that could be commoditized, could be bought potentially programmatic or other places. So have a point of view, but also break through the box. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's, it's not enough anymore to go into a meeting and show them your wares, your nice PowerPoint, and uh, get yes to death and wait for the RFP. And maybe you're even getting it on the client level as well. You need to kind of break through the box. Um, we're all, you know, put into different categories. And sometimes it works for us as publishers, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, you know, in the case if you're a women's property and you want to go beyond just, you know, dating, but the fact that you can reach millennials, these are the types of boxes that you have to break out. That you're more than just some data solution. You bring all sorts of other insights to the table as well. You know, agencies like Human Nature want to categorize what they do. It's easy, um, and you know, it's, it's in order to streamline the process. But I think to be successful in this new world, you kind of have to break through those things. A couple examples in you know my past experience at IGN, we were a gaming property. So naturally, if there was a gaming RFP, we weren't necessarily a must buy, but we were certainly a must consider in most cases. But that, you know, that, you know, that by itself wasn't a business for us. We wanted to, you know, there aren't, there are only so many gaming RFPs out there. So we tried to branch off and did branch off into less about gaming, more about hard to reach young guys, you know, through that, through this very safe environment. Where I was at Bizarre Voice, you know, there were no quote unquote, or there weren't that many shopper media RFPs. We had to find our own way into that in the ecosystem. So we went in there with the assertion that, you know what? You're spending a lot of money on a top-line awareness brand basis. You have budgets for e-commerce. We're in the middle. We're reach, you're reaching with us. You're reaching people in consideration, actually in mode of shopping, um, in the consideration set, middle funnel. You know, you're, there's a big part of your media plan that's missing 
when you don't include us. I'm sure you can come up with your own stories, but the point being is you need to break out of the box. And then related to this, um, you're not going to break out of the box with the junior buyers. You're really not going to even break out of the box with the RFP process. Um, a friend of mine, Universal McCann, I thought put it really well where if it doesn't fit into the RFP, we throw it out. Even if it's a great idea, um, we're going to just go ahead and throw it out. And I'm sure other agencies feel that way as well where, you know what, if it doesn't fit within that streamlined process, um, you know what, onward and upward. We don't have time for it. In fairness to them, they don't have time. This is why you need to get to senior agency level folks. You need to get to the senior level clients. Um, you need to demonstrate a need, demonstrate a solution, and demonstrate how you fit into that solution well before it ever gets to that process. And again, the RFP world is getting smaller as we go on. So let's now change gears and talk about programmatic. Um, certainly something that uh, I think causes some insecurity among some, maybe some quizzical looks among others, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I think part of the problem with programmatic right now is that it's being more, you know, forced as being overly complicated when it doesn't have to be. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to like to do is try to demystify some of the terms and some of the aspects of that marketplace in the couple minutes that we have left. First off, I wanted to show this picture because this isn't a situation where, you know, it's the, you know, the automobile displacing the horse. Um, I really look at programmatic as additive and it really is just kind of a solution to a, a problem that's out there. When you think about it, we talked about the 500 plus folks that are competing for those agency and brand dollars. Um, how do you, you know, economically efficiently buy them and sell them in an effective way? That's where programmatic comes in. We're talking about if you read about the fact that now, you know, there's talk of, you know, eventually television or video being automated. Um, in print as well. It makes sense. You know, it's, it used to be when I first started in the cable business, there were maybe 15 cable networks that were worth anything, that were really relevant, that buyers had to pay attention to. It's well, you know, it's four times that and doesn't, doesn't even include all the various video solutions, you know. We're even talking about Netflix as a broadcast network a couple of years ago or a year ago. Things have changed. I mean, it's funny that we're in this technolog technological side of the business yet um, we're still dealing with such antiquated ways of doing business. You know, the I.O. was not something that was invented, I guess, specifically for digital. It was because a bunch of ex-print guys that then became part of digital sales said we need something to kind of close a deal. Broadcast tended to be more faxes and handshakes, so let's, let's have the insertion order. Um, it's worked for many years. Is it the most efficient way of doing business, especially with all the players that are out there? No. So let's, let's talk a little bit about programmatic. Um, both what it is, and I think also most significantly for everybody on this call, what it is not. At its simplest form, it is automation. It's, you know, one of the quotes that I love and, or definitions, and I think this is attributed to Marissa Mayer at Yahoo, is that it's the opposite of manual. It's, um, it's automatic. And I'm not going to read the full quote here. You can also go to the IED, um, and there's, I think the URL is there at the bottom, and go ahead and check it out yourself. But anyway, um, check, go ahead and look at it right there. But what it is not just by itself is real-time bidding. Um, you know, the bidding of getting the lowest deal at the best CPM, open marketplace where um, a number of players are competing, mostly on a blind, blind basis. That's really how it started, kind of an offshoot of where the ad networks were, many performance-driven advertisers, performance-driven brands that were just looking. They didn't care where the inventory was. They didn't care what brands that inventory was associated with, where the content or environment was. It was just give me the lowest eyeball that might be able to go ahead and turn around a click. And then, of course, you know, back in the day, RTV was where many people, you know, not everybody participated, not the, certainly not the premium brands. And if they did, um, they weren't putting in their best inventory. That's not saying that RTB or real-time bidding is going away, but I would argue that it's going to be a smaller part of that overall programmatic pie. So here's the next slide. For those of you on the phone, a good thing to kind of print out, and uh, you can also find this on the IAB as well, that I think kind of just, you know, shows the pipe, so to speak, and also gives you a quick top line of really what is the programmatic ecosystem. And it really isn't that much different than how we're selling digital now, just with a few more players. Still on the left, you have the you know, ad server, the agency um, on the left. On the right, you have the publisher and their ad server. And then in between, you have on the publisher side, the sales side, the SSP, the supply side provider. Then talking to the DSP, the, the, the demand supply provider. And then they're working through a trading desk, which in most cases, but not all cases, is going to be associated with a specific agency. And then talking to the ad server. 
That's it in its most basic function. There's obviously other nuances to this. There's yield management tools and companies. There's companies that tie into creative. Um, there's the data management platforms that are out there, managed service groups. Again, you can pull up the Loomiscape if you're familiar with this and find a variety of different folks that play in this ecosystem. But at its basic level, this is what it's all about. Um, and I think it kind of sheds a nice light on it. So again, going to the next slide here, it's just really looking at the you know, path to purchase, so to speak, from programmatic. It starts out with the advertiser. In some cases, their own trading desk. In most cases, right now, at least through an agency trading desk. Then flowing to the demand side platform, talking to the buy side or the sell side, the supply side platform, and then talking to the publisher. That's it. Again, lots of nuance around this and you know, various players, whether it's turn on the DSP side to Rubicon and Pubmatic on the SSP sell side to the variety of publishers. This isn't all of them, obviously that participate in this, but this gives you some general idea. And there's more where, where obviously we can get into, but we don't have time for the purposes of this call. So another slide I get, think worth saving, also I believe coming from the IAB as well, and something worth printing, is just a, a, a bit of a chart here that shows the different holding companies and the respective trading desks that they're associated with and respective agencies. A couple things to note about this. Um, it's a fluid situation. And what I'm showing you here is not absolute by any means. So what I mean by that is that in many cases, just because a brand is associated with Group M doesn't necessarily mean they're being purchased on a trading desk basis by Xaxis. So in the case of brands such as for Group M, like Unilever or Kimberly Clark, they actually have their own trading desks that I believe are powered by Group M, but they aren't working with Xaxis. There's other examples of this as well, um, but this at least gives you an idea and at least a starting point. And it's okay not to have all the answers versus the worlds where we've come from in, you know, in digital and general media where you need to know who the agency is and what you don't know who the AOR is in that point. Um, you know, it changes on a daily basis and in many cases in meetings that I've been in, you go in and sometimes the buyers on the direct digital side don't even know as well. But at least this is a good starting point and a good, a good slide to hold on to. So I want to get into the different transaction types of programmatic. I don't want to overcomplicate things, and there's not that much time here for the purposes of our call, but I want to at least you know, highlight a couple of things. And really just, I think for our purposes today, and you can go in the IAB and, um, and find maybe a more detailed explanation of this, it really comes down to two major formats or two ways of doing business right now on a programmatic basis. One is what we talked about, RTD, open auction, very little visibility. You're not exactly sure what you're getting. You're not exactly 100% sure which publishers you're buying in, in many cases. It's about the lowest CPM, and that CPM isn't guaranteed. And the other is you can call it unreserved fixed rate. There's other names for it, depending on who you talk to, whether it's programmatic, direct, or PMP, private marketplace. Again, PMP, people just love to overcomplicate things. And that's a situation where, again, the inventory is not guaranteed. It's unreserved, but you can fix a CPM and you can go ahead and specify the types of publishers that you want to work with. So again, going to the next slide here is just another example of what some of the differences are. You know, where open is just as its early days are, it's, it's about, you know, cookie-based targeting, just finding the right audience. It's less about visibility and transparency. You're not quite sure what you're getting. Versus private, where it gives the ability for buyers to go ahead and specify the publisher or publishers that they want to work with. And they're also going to have access to better inventory. And also a first look at that same inventory as well versus, again, you know, the remnant um, or the inventory that flows into the open marketplace, that's the last leg. If, you know, it will be picked up there because it hasn't been picked up at anywhere else, including your direct relationships. This is an illustration that I thought might be helpful. We've used this in our training at Prohaska. And on the left, you have the open marketplace, the open RTB. On the right, you have the private marketplace. So on the left, you have everybody kind of sifting through the clothes. This is kind of a retail analogy where they're saying, you know, looking for, you know, less about the brand, more about finding the right fit of clothing. You know, it's, you know, you know, does it work or does it not work? A lot of detective work. Sometimes they can find a deal. They can find a gem. Um, if you notice on the left, there's no salespeople. It's crowded. It's chaotic. Um, it's a bit of a mess. And then you go on the right, the private marketplace. Um, not as many people there. It's private. It's not. A, a, not everyone has access to it. Only your best partners, if you're on the uh, on the publisher side. There is a salesperson there. Everything is well lit and branded. You, you know what you're getting. 
You can go a further iteration of this and talk about your direct relationships where there's more bells and whistles and things that you would only sell on a direct basis, but you get the analogy here. I mean, one thing that we talk about with the open marketplace, and you've been reading about this in the trades, there's still fraud in digital advertising. Um, there's still some bad you know, actors out there. Um, you know, and unfortunately, they still lurk in many cases within these open marketplaces. Obviously, one of the advantages for um, an agency or a trading desk or a brand to go ahead and do business on a private basis is you know what you're getting. You can get a decent deal on pricing, or maybe not guarantee the inventory, but you know what you're getting in terms of environment, viewability, and other bells and whistles. And then, of course, if you want more bells and whistles, that's where you talk to your salesperson. But in either case, as we're going to talk about, within the private marketplace, the salesperson doesn't go away. They're involved in both aspects of this. So some questions for publishers that um, you really need to be asking yourself. First off, what is your strategy for programmatic? Um, you know, again, as we talked about in the first slide, it used to be you just need to be aware of it. Yeah, it's kind of out there. You know, a couple years ago, it wasn't uncommon for people to say, we're not doing it, we're not touching it. We don't do have any type of programmatic relationship. I think that's changed. The other thing is, what is your SSP or exchange solution, who you're working with? In many cases, in some cases, the publisher may not even be aware of it, or the head of sales might, may, may not be aware of it. You may already have a relationship. You may, you may already be working with a Pomatic, a Google, a Rubicon, but you may not have it really turned on for all intents and purposes. What's your data strategy? All publishers have first-party data in one way, shape, or form. Um, the question is, how valuable is it? And really, most significant, can you put it into action? Do you have a data management platform, a DMP, that actually can go ahead and utilize it? And then last, but certainly not least, is sales team integration. How are they going to work in this programmatic landscape? It's a moving target. It's evolving. Um, it's changing. But you need to start thinking about those questions as well as compensation. One slide just to kind of highlight some of this and just really where we see things going from a marketplace standpoint. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, stage one really was, you know, programmatic was really more of just the next iteration of ad networks. You know, for many people, um, AdMill was just a platform to manage your various ad network relationships. And then from there, it, it turned into programmatic. So really, it was just kind of turning on the pipes, and in many cases, publishers not doing anything about it. Stage two was maybe a couple of people. This is how it usually started out, usually coming from the operations side and going ahead and, you know, starting to do some deals with the trading desks and maybe talking to some of the DSPs, but really not a big effort. Where we see a lot of things happening right now is stage three, and that is, you know, where and I'm sure you're already experiencing this if you're on the sales side. That is, you know, your salespeople coming in out of meetings saying, hey, they're asking about programmatic. Do we do programmatic solutions? And you scratching your head on several fronts. One is, you know, can we even, you know, implement something like this and be, my God, is this going to cannibalize my existing business? Um, you know, and so inevitably if you are doing something, if the pipes are on, you're probably throwing a programmatic lead over to the guys on the operations side that are working with it, and that's about it. But really where we see the business going is it's less about, you know, a siloed approach. It's really more about an integrated approach, and that is that, you know, programmatic's another lever. Um, for your sales efforts. You have your direct lever, your direct channels where you're selling inventory, certain types of inventory and sponsorships, things that can't necessarily be scaled or standardized, that's going to be direct. And then you still have a bulk of your inventory that could be sold on a programmatic direct basis and maybe another silo, or not silo, but another you know, bulk of inventory on an open basis. That doesn't mean, you know, the, the one thing that it, we should emphasize, that doesn't mean just because something's automated um, there's no need for salespeople. While inventory can be automated, demand cannot be. And one of the things that we've discovered, both in my own experience and just working with other publisher partners, is that you know, just because you turn this stuff on doesn't mean it's going to happen by itself. There is no set it and forget it. There is, but you're not going to be that effective. So in terms of as you engage with private deals in the marketplace on a programmatic standpoint, you're still going to need salespeople to go ahead and engage with those folks. You're still going to need to have people interacting with the trading desk, interacting with the clients. Again, it's another way of transacting business. It's just another solution. So I think it's just something that should be emphasized. So I wanted to also kind of bring up just really a quick note in hiring and retention. Um, related to everything we talked about on the enterprise side of the business, 
Um, it isn't just about being a good relationship person and jeans parties and, and sneakers and whatever the case might be. It's being more solution-oriented, solution not just from a programmatic standpoint. You know, um, for many of you, you know, digital wasn't your first stop in media. For some of you, um, myself included, you know, this is, you know, you were there before digital. So, you know, you reinvented yourself. You transformed with this new medium, this new platform. The same could be said if you're in digital now. We have to keep, you know, we have to keep moving. We have to keep transforming. So it's, it's more tech-savvy people. It's more people that are, you know, enterprise versus just transactional. And then the last point that I would make is it's also, you know, recruiting outside of the industry in some cases. We have a great deal of talent on the digital side, um, both with agencies as well as on the sales side as well. But you know what? It's... Um, there's nothing wrong with, as my friend Doug Weaver would say, diversifying the gene pool and going out to other industries. You look at the ad tech world, many of the people that are in ad tech now didn't come from media, didn't come from the agency world. They came from places like finance. So just something to think about as we go ahead and retain and recruit. You know, there's a lot of other talent out there. And if you're a salespeople or salesperson and you're listening to this, you know what? Um, you know what? Diversify yourself. Diversify your talent. You know, embrace all of this stuff and read it, read about it, learn about it, because it isn't going away. Um, it's a good time to be in this industry. So, in closing, I just want to say before we kind of turn it over to questions, keep moving. There is, uh, you know what? This business has its challenges, but it's, uh, you know, there's a reason we're all here. It's not just because uh, it's sedentary and things remain static, things don't move. It's because it's, you know, there's a different problem. You know, every day there's a new challenge every day. We're constantly drinking from the fire hose, keeping up with all the information that's out there. You know, the, you know, they like to talk about media not being brain surgery. It isn't. You do need to keep up with everything that's going on. And that's kind of fun, too, just because, you know, you think you have it down one minute. You need to keep moving and keep, you know, moving forward and learning other information that's out there. So with that said, again, I hope this was helpful. I know we went through it fairly quickly in the limited time that we have. And I would just say embrace, embrace change and keep moving. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Samir, and uh, we can answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, Scott. This is uh, definitely very enlightening. We got a, a bunch of questions uh, along the way, and uh, for people that still have questions, just put it in the chat window. Uh, one of the questions we got was uh, came from an agency planner and buyer, and she was asking, with all the parties offering programmatic, what are the true differ differentiators? that they should be asking about and looking for. A lot of the pitches I hear sound very similar. Sure, in term, as far as what the programmatic pitch might be, in terms of what the opportunity, how do, how do you differentiate? As an agency planner and buyer. Sure, I, you know what, I think that there's basic questions that you can, as an agency planner, ask, you know, which SSP are you working with? Um, but I would also ask in terms of, you know what, if you're looking at a private deal, you know, it's going to be up to that publisher to decide which inventory goes into that private marketplace. Is it standard ROS? Is it just, you know, general remnant? Or are there specific sections that they would make available? Certainly the question of data and how you can further target on a programmatic basis, those would be some questions that I would ask as well. But, you know, just because, you know, open RTB is what it is. It's open. It can be anything and everything. There's very little visibility. Um, in the private marketplace, there's an opportunity for a little more differentiation. So beyond just the mechanics of, you know, who are you working with, um, you know, what's the deal ID or whatever the case might be, you know, which inventory would you make available on a private basis? And then it's certainly, you know, getting into pricing and, and elements about your audience. Great. And another one, you talked about recruiting and mentioned finance. Are there any other industries or backgrounds that you would recommend recruiting from? You know, it's I got a variety. And, you know, everyone talks about finance because of, you know, it's the numbers aspect of the business. Certainly you look at some of the, you know, ad tech companies and they're, look, you know, they're hiring data scientists from, you know, Nassau to, to work on their business. From a sales standpoint, which is I would imagine most people who are on this call are coming from, you know what, it's, I think it's, it's people that are creative because just because we're dealing in numbers, just because things are automated doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you should be looking, you know, at strictly things from a quantifiable standpoint. I think it's, I think it's a variety of different industries. But, you know, I think even people that don't necessarily have a digital background um, but have an enterprise sales background, have been selling software or technology, know how to talk to a client, 
know how to uncover challenges, open up solutions, things like that. You know, dig through the various levels of, of an agency or client. I think those are the types of people. I mean, you can learn product. It's sometimes harder to learn actually how to sell. Sounds good, Scott. Another question someone was asking, what are your thoughts on how programmatic is going to affect pricing? You know, it's, it's funny. I think you so early days it was, you know, it was, you know, people used to use the term race to the bottom. Um, but when you had the fact that, you know, smaller players, least less desirable inventory was going in there and mostly bottom, you know, bottom seeking, you know, performance driven advertisers, it was lower CPMs. But I think as you see more inventory moving into the programmatic space on a private basis, I think you're going to see CPMs go up. In some cases, we're seeing publishers actually driving, and you can believe this or not, it's true, it's more than one, driving higher CPMs on a programmatic basis than they are on a direct basis. In some cases, from a priority standpoint, they're actually putting their programmatic deals at a higher priority from serving than they are for their direct deals. So I think, uh, like anything else, it's, it's going to even out. I think it's going to go up. Okay. Another question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the future of ad networks, given the growth of programmatic? You know, I, I think ad networks are really, they're, they're morphing into programmatic. I think some have already gone away. They've been purchased for various variety of reasons. I think, you know, in mobile there's still a big need for them. That may change at some point as well. But I think it's they're either going to go away or they're going to morph more into the programmatic space, and you're already starting to see that. Okay. Uh, then someone was asking, how does uh, programmatic affect just direct salespeople and, and their relationships? How valuable are those relationships? Uh, you touched on it earlier, but uh, if there's anything to expand on that. No, I'm glad you asked the question because I, I really wanted to emphasize that point. It, it's direct relationships are still going to be important. Relationships in general are still going to be important. Um, you got to think about it. Programmatic isn't an end; it's a means. So it's just another way of transacting the business. We didn't get into the big details here, but programmatic. You know, there's there's a term called programmatic um, guaranteed where. You may do a direct guarantee deal. You just may actually implement it on a programmatic basis. Um, salespeople are still going to be needed. You know, just because you turn the pipes on doesn't mean you're going to turn demand on. You know, we've discovered in, in previous places we've worked with that, you know, just because you have a couple people um, on the operations side working with the trading desk doesn't mean you're going to drive demand. Doesn't mean that HP or Ford or General Motors or whatever the brand is is going to know that they can do private deals with you or to go ahead and work with you, you still need salespeople to reach out to these people. Um, again, both at the brand level, the agency level, um, and on the trading desk level as well. You know, it doesn't change anything. If anything, your job gets a little bit more complicated. There's more people to reach out to. But just as we talked about before, it can't just be about the RFP buyers. You need to be reaching out to other levels of an agency and other levels of a client to be effective. Again, that's the you know definition of that enterprise salesperson. It's somebody who's hitting the stakeholders, the champions, the influencers across an organization, not just the funnel end. Thanks, Scott. Uh, another question. This, uh, in Advertising Week, Netflix and Kellogg mentioned that they're doing programmatic direct. Do, do, you, do you see other companies doing that as well? Yeah, it's, it's something we, I think we, we touched on um, during the presentation, sh certainly, as far as um, you know, Kellogg's, Netflix, they're doing, they're creating their own trading desks um, outside of the agency. I think you are going to see more of it. p and is doing it. I, mean, I referenced Unilever and Kimberly Clark. Um, you know what, I see it working for some brands. I don't see it working for others. You know what, will it work for a big brand like a p and Sure. Will it work for a small, you know, regional brand? I don't know, maybe eventually. But I think right now the capital cost and bandwidth may be too much. So I think you are going to see more. There's been some studies out there and surveys and stories that, you know, that 70% of brands surveyed are going to consider creating their own, uh, you know, trading desk solution. Um, we'll see. But I certainly see it, see it being a growing trend. Definitely. And another question is, uh, 
Can programmatic help achieve a variety of goals and KPIs, such as awareness, site traffic, and conversions? Or would you skew programmatic's effectiveness towards DR-based campaigns? You know, I guess you could say that for RTD, for the open exchange, but, you know, not necessarily. I think, again, if you look at it at its basic definition, you know, on the open RTD where it's just about lowest CPM, less visibility on the inventory, sure, that, that would make sense. But when you're talking about, you know, again, more brand advertisers are getting involved with this. Um, Kellogg's isn't just a DR advertiser. Um, Netflix is no longer just a DR advertiser. That's one of the reasons why they're building their own, um, you know, trading desk solution. Um, it's really just another pipe to go ahead and transact the business. Rather than faxing the I.O., um, setting the tags, it's really, I mean, it's just another way of transacting that's much more efficient. You don't need to deal with the same light items as a seller or a buyer that you once had to do. It's just really, you know, through the computer automated. So that's why I think it's, you know, whether it's performance or it's, it's more brand goal, it doesn't matter. It's, this is just another lever. But I will say, just to answer that, you know, at the same time, it does create a more efficient way of buying and target audi targeting audience, and certainly that has applications in whether you are a performance-driven advertiser or one that's more, you know, more focused on brand metrics or brand lift. Great. There was a, another question talking about just the difference between agencies and clients in terms of their goals or KPIs. Uh, I think you touched on it a little bit. Is, is there anything else? You can add add to it. Yeah, no, I just it's 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 again. It's, I think it comes from a practical standpoint. You know, a brand goals. You know, if you you know you look at the ag the agenda or what keeps up a brand manager at night, it's going to be very different than what keeps up the um, the digital media supervisor that you might be dealing with. Um, they're looking at things in much more of the aggregate. They're looking about moving things from a market share standpoint, not about whether um, you know you're going to be able to deliver on the impression goal that you said you deliver or the quick views that you thought you could deliver on for digital. So I think you just need to be aware, made aware. You know, rather than arguing, you know, click-through rates, which is you know still an argument that's out there among digital buyers and sellers, um, isn't it better to argue? You know what? you're reaching a better audience with us and it's for these reasons and, and why. You know, the goal of this client is not X, it's Y, and this is why we fit into that. So it's, I think, you did, again, you just need to be aware of both. It's going to vary by brand. It's going to vary by, um, by client. And it's just up to you to kind of, you know, do the detective work to find that information out. Great. Uh, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I think we're uh, running out of time, and so we'll... We'll finish up here. If there's any follow-up questions, obviously reach out to to uh, us at Redbooks or Scott uh, as well. His contact information is on the slide. And we'll have a recording of this up next week. Uh, thanks, everybody.